Okay, in this section, we're going to get into the definition of a limit. But before we do, let's, let's look at what we learned. Um, we found with this function that this function is not defined at 2, but it appears to have a limit as x approaches 2. So we determined that the limit nears 4 as x approaches 2. This function is not defined at negative 1, but a limit appears to get uh, to exist. We found that the limit gets near 3 as x approaches negative 1. This function is not defined at 3, but a limit does not exist either, because this one had that unbounded behavior, where as we approach 3 from one side or the other, the graph... Uh, increased or decreased without bound. And this one was undefined at 2 and the limit did not exist as x approaches 2 because the the limit from the left and the limit from the right did not agree because we got two different numbers. So you can see that you know we have functions where the function is not defined at a number but a limit appears to exist and you can have functions not defined at a number and a limit does not exist. So we have to be very careful when evaluating limits. In this last one, we found that with this one, as x approached infinity, this one appeared to go to 2. So, so the limit gets closer and closer to 2 as x goes to infinity. Okay, let's talk about the definition of, well, I'm sorry, let's talk about the limit notation. So the limit notation, and so this is how we express a limit. We write the limit of f of x equals l. So if the limit exists, we generally call it l if we don't know the number. Now f is some function, and we're evaluating the limit of some function as x approaches some number c. So the way we read this, this is read the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. Again, the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. It simply means that the limit of the function gets arbitrarily close to l as x approaches c. Arbitrarily close means we can get as close to l as we like by selecting values close enough to c. So you saw up there that Visually, we didn't prove this algebraically yet, but visually, you saw in this function, uh, x squared minus 4 over x minus 2, you saw visually and you saw in a table that the closer I got to 2, the closer this function got to 4. And then you saw visually here that as this function approaches, as x approaches 2 for this function, we don't, we don't actually approach a particular number because remember the, the two sides disagreed. So there are some other functions that we can talk about where limits may or may not exist. Okay, I'm going to try to freehand this, but you can do better if you look at a graphing utility. Okay, so this function, let's talk about what happens as x approaches 0. Well, for this function, as you start out to the left of 0, as you get closer and closer to 0, you'll see it oscillate. But as you get real close to zero, it starts to oscillate real fast. So it just keeps going up and down between one and negative one. And the same thing happens from this side. As you get closer and closer to zero, it starts oscillating real fast. So, so that limit, in other words, this function never approaches a number as x approaches zero. So we would say that this limit uh, does not exist. Um, one over x squared, well, that one, as x approaches 0, as you approach 0 from the left, it would take off like that. And then as you approach 0 from the right, it would take off like that. So this would be one of those unbounded behavior. So that's what would happen for y equals 1 over x squared as x approaches 0. Okay, so let's take a look at this graph. This graph says you have 3x plus 2 if x does not equal 1. So basically you just have the line 3x plus 2, except when x is 1, you actually have a hole in it because x is not equal 1. 
And then it says when x does equal 1, you have 7. So this point right here is the point 1, 7. So that's the y value. But what's interesting is you still have a limit as x approaches 1 from the left. It's actually this number right here, what that number is. And you can figure out what that number is because you can tell where 3x plus 2 would be going if x approached 1 by just plugging the 1 in. So you can see that 3 times 1 plus 2 would be 5. So you can see that as you approach 1 from the left, it's got to be going to 5. And the same thing as you approach 1 from the right, it's got to be going to 5. This right here has to be the y value 5. Okay. Now, even though the function is defined to be a totally different value, see the limit can still exist and be a different number. Okay. Now, the next one, basically you have a very similar thing, but this time we defined the we defined it when x is 1 to equal 5, so that point actually fills in the hole. Okay, so that seems a little weird, but it fills in the hole. But still, the limit is the same. The limit is still 5. So whether th this hole has a definition or not doesn't matter. The limit is still 5 in both cases. Now, this is a complex definition. And so it's not an easy definition to follow. Um, but basically, this is the formal definition of a limit. Let f be a function defined over an open interval containing the number c, except possibly at c, and let l be a real number. So the statement, the limit of f of x as x approaches c equals l, means the following. It means that for any epsilon greater than 0, there will be a delta greater than zero. Now, epsilon and delta are just numbers. Excuse me, are just numbers. Such that if this is true, in other words, if this is true, then this is true. Okay? Now, an alternative way to say this, if you work with absolute value inequalities, um, you can actually rewrite this like this. So this is another way to state this first statement here. So if you say the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, well that would be the same as saying x minus c is between delta and negative delta, and then uh, so x would have to be between c minus delta and c plus delta. And you can do the same thing here. So this would mean f of x minus l has to be between epsilon and negative epsilon. So f of x would have to be between uh, L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. Okay, so let's try to look at a simple example here. Okay, you can probably guess that this limit is true because if you evaluate the function at 2, you'll get 2 plus 5 is 7. But let's see how we can show this. First of all, the function is x plus 5, so f of x is x plus 5. C is this number 2. And the limit L is 7. To actually prove the limit, which you may be asked to do in the class, we need to show that for any positive number epsilon, there is another positive number delta such that this is going to be true if this is true. Okay? So basically, we can do this. Since the absolute value of x plus 5 minus 7 is less than epsilon, is the same as saying absolute value of x minus 2 is less than epsilon, then we can just say delta should always equal epsilon. See, this is absolute value of f of x minus l, right? Well, it turns out that this is also the same as absolute value of x minus c. So as long as this is epsilon, then this will be epsilon. So I mean, sorry, as long as this is less than epsilon, then this will be less than epsilon. So the delta that we're going to choose here is just to make sure our delta is the same as the epsilon value. Now, here's an example where the delta is not the same as the epsilon value. Okay, so here's another one. The limit of 5x minus 3 as x approaches 1 is 2. 
Okay, so f of x is 5x minus 3, c is 1, l is 2. Okay, let's see what we can do with that one. Okay, you may have noticed I changed something there, but anyway. Um, so, to prove this limit is true, we need to show that for each epsilon greater than 0, so for every epsilon greater than 0, there's a number delta such that this is true whenever this is true. Okay, so notice this is f of x minus l in here, and this is uh, this is uh, x minus c in here. c is 1. Okay, so now it turns out that if you take this inequality, well, if you simplify this, you get 5x minus 5 in the absolute value. Well, since the absolute value of 5 is 5, we can factor 5 out and see that 5 that's the same as saying 5 times the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than epsilon. So if we just let um, divide both sides by 5, notice we'll see that absolute value of x minus 1 is going to be less than epsilon. And so if we let delta just be epsilon over 5, so if we let delta be epsilon over 5, then that will satisfy the definition. So in other words, whatever epsilon is, as long as I choose delta to be one-fifth of it, then I'll always have the proof um, satisfied. So delta is equal to epsilon over 5. Let me show you an example down here. Okay, So let's look at this graph here. So we're going to say uh, epsilon is 0.1 and delta is 0.05. So the horizontal lines here um, are going to be um, 2 plus 0.1 and 2 minus 0.1. So let me give those to you. Okay, this picture actually got cropped too much, but pretend like this horizontal line is where the graph intersects this vertical line. Okay, so, so this top line is y equal L plus epsilon. So in other words, that top line is y equal 2 plus 0.1. And that bottom line down here, this bottom red line, is y equal to minus 0.1. Okay, so if we let delta equal epsilon over 5.02, then, okay, here's the number 1, right? Okay, well, let's look at x equal 1 plus 0.02. That would be this line here. That's 1 plus 0.02. And this line here. Is this other line is 1 minus 0.02. Okay, so now we have a delta window on the x-axis such that our function remains in the epsilon window. So here's our epsilon window. These two horizontal lines are our epsilon window. So for that epsilon window, we showed that there is a delta window about x equal 1 such that as long as I choose values within this delta window, that all of my y values will remain in this epsilon window. So again, it's, it's a confusing uh, definition, but uh, that's basically what you're trying to show. It gets real difficult when you start working with quadratics. Here, I have to show that for every epsilon, there's a delta such that the square root of x squared minus 4 is less than epsilon, uh, whenever this is true. Well, it turns out that this is less than epsilon would mean that you can factor this into x plus 2, x minus 2 is less than epsilon. But if you select an interval about x equal 2, like let's say 1 to 3, well, then if x is 1, then this is going to be less than 3. And if x is 3, this is going to be less than 5. So we can just choose the bigger one. x plus 2 is less than 5. That's always going to be true over that interval from 1 to 3. And then we can say, okay, then we have 5 times the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than epsilon. So the absolute value of x minus 2 must be less than epsilon over 5. And then that way I've shown that when this is true, then this is true. In other words, basically up there I replaced the 5 with the absolute value. I replaced the absolute value of x plus 2 with 5, so that's where that 5 came from. And we'll look at some properties in the next section.